Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the Foothills Church of Gilroy. We're so glad you're a part of today's message and you're a part of our church. And so welcome and thank you for, uh, for being a part of this today. And we're going to talk about a new subject. We're going to be talking about the kingdom of God still, but we're going to talk about kingdom currency. And uh, what, what, is, uh, what do we buy with our life? Uh, what do we purchase with our life? And it all has to do with kingdom currency. And so before we get into that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for your kingdom. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come and your will be done in our hearts as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray that you would anoint this message and that you would anoint our ears to hear what your spirit says to us, your church. In Jesus' name, Amen. So let's talk about currency for a minute. Uh, the thing about currency, um, 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now it doesn't say money. People misquote this verse all the time. They say, well, money's the root of all evil. No, it isn't. Money's not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. But here's what's tricky about money. We all need it. We all need it. Unless you're living off the grid out in the mountains somewhere, you're, then you wouldn't be watching this message. So if you're watching this message, that means you have a television or a computer or a phone. You need money. We need money to survive. We just can't love it. We just can't love it or we'll have problems. In that passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6, where he says, you know, money's the, the love of money is the root of all evil, he talks about how people in pursuit of money and chasing after money, Paul does, have pierced themselves with many griefs and have wandered from the faith. That's how powerful and dangerous money is. It's powerful in the sense that we need it. It's dangerous in the sense that if we love it, we'll have a problem. See, the pursuit of money leads us down a bad road. We want to earn money. We want to work hard for money. We want to be wise with our money, but we don't want to love it so that it leads us down a bad road. I say it this way. Listen, think of it like a car. Money will always be in the car. It, it factors into our decisions. If you're going on vacation, you're going to factor in finances, what it costs. Can you pay for it? If you're going to buy a car, if you're going to buy a home, buying groceries, you're looking at two items. They're roughly the same, but one's cheaper. You know, money will always be in the car, but it should never be in the front seat of your life and never, absolutely never in the driver's seat. But there are people who live their lives and money's in the driver's seat of their life. My mom used to tell my wife and I when we were first married, if you wait to have kids until you can afford it, you'll never have kids. So there's just sometimes you, you, you have to do what's right or you have to do what's needed and let the money thing take care of itself and happen. Let God deal with it and help you. Uh, so money should never behind the, be behind the wheel. That place rightfully belongs to the Lord alone. Let the Lord make your decisions and the finances will come. I like to say it this way in our church. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. And if he's for it, he'll fund it. A couple of things for you to think about. This is why, and, and the problem with money, loving it, needing it, and all that, that struggle, uh, this is why Jesus told us that you, you cannot serve both God and money. Because you'll love the one and hate the other, or you'll hate the one and love the other. So we can't love both God and money. We can't serve both God and money. We have to make a decision. I want to love God and serve God and not money. Because money can be a real problem. So, But even though money is a problem... God created a system of currency. We have a system of currency in, in all walks of life. Now, there may not be actual coins or dollar bills or, or you know, yen, rupee, whatever, whatever uh, coin you use, whatever currency system you have, but there is a system of currency because we need to barter and trade. But it's also, God gave us a system of currency so that the fruit of our labor could be recognized within a community. 
You work hard and you should be rewarded financially. That's the fruit of your labor. And so God gave us a system of, of, of currency so that we could be recognized in the community. And in God's community, though, the currency is different. In our, in our community with, on earth, it's dollars and, and, and cents. But with God's community, it's not the fruit of our labor. It's the fruit of our life. The fruit of our lives. Our words and our action. That consists of the currency of your life. And this is why Jesus said it's by your fruit that you are known. Your fruit is your produce. That's what you produce. So our words and actions produce things in the kingdom realm, God's kingdom. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. By their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, their produce, what, what their words and actions are. So look, it's very difficult to know who someone is just by their words. Because people can say a lot of things. But you can be certain who a person is by what they do. Don't believe a person's words. Believe their actions. Believe their actions. I had somebody tell me that they want to get off alcohol. That they have a problem with alcohol. Well, I said, here's some things you need to do. If you want to get off alcohol. Whether or not this person does those things is yet to be seen. But here's the point. You can say you want to get off alcohol, but what are you going to do about it? Are you going to go to meetings? Are you going to put it away? Are you going to reach out for help? Are you going to seek a higher power and the higher power being the Lord Jesus Christ? You, you can't believe a person's words. You have to believe what they do. See that saying, actions speak louder than words? It's very true. Actions do speak louder than words. You can say, you know what? I love God and I want to serve God. Okay. What do you do about it? Do you just say you want to love God and you want to serve Him? Or do you volunteer at church? Do you read His Word? Do you pray? Do you give Him thanks? Are you kind to people? You know, are you treating people with love like He commands us to do in Matthew chapter 22? See, now in this passage where Jesus talks about by their fruit you recognize them, Jesus is speaking about trees and how good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. And so you know whether a tree is good or not by the fruit it produces. And that's the only way that you can truly judge a tree is by the produce. I planted two trees in my backyard, two, two tangerine trees in my backyard um, a couple years ago. They just aren't producing anything. We had some beautiful buds on, on, on the one tree, and we had a bunch of little fruit. But the problem is they were all, these were tangerines, and they were all about that big. <laughs> not very good. It's just not a very good tree. Yet, it may grow and develop, and, and we're giving it time. But that's how you judge a tree is by the fruit it produces. Now, the fruit that Jesus is referring to, though, I mean, he, he uses trees as his analogy, but he's really talking about a person's conduct, how you live your life. It matters. Now, what you say is important, but how you live is more telling than your confession. See, relating to God's kingdom, our, content, our conduct, more than our confession, is most telling of our convictions. Now, it's, it's by our confession that we're saved, but it's by, it's by our actions, it's by our conduct that we prove our confession to be true. As James states in James 2.14, he says this, What good is it if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? In that particular instance, in James chapter 2, He's saying, what good is it if, you're, if your brother is, is poor and, and, and not clothed well and, and cold and hungry, and you say, hey, God bless you, but you don't meet his needs. You don't give him some money for um, a little bit of food or clothing. What good would that do? So we need, to, we need to match. We want to. 
And we need to match our actions with our words. That our, our conduct and our confession meet. And, and they, they say a similar thing to people. See, the application of this, James' words in James 2.14, is this. What difference would it make if you're a Christian and you claim to be a Christian, but you're just a huge jerk to people? That's not gonna, that's not gonna win anybody. That's not gonna, that's not gonna buy you any favor. What, what good would that do? What would it buy you if you if you claim to be a Christian, but you're a huge jerk to people? They're gonna say, you know what? I, I really don't want what that guy's talking about. So our actions, they they matter. It's it's how people will know you, and and then it's also how you'll know favor. Is when you have good deeds, when your when your confession and your conduct are are joined together. You'll know favor in your life. It's how you'll be known, and it's how you'll know favor. Micah, the prophet, he said this in Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Those three things. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So this verse is about our conduct before God and people. Walking humbly before God. But then how we treat people. To act justly means to treat others the way you want to be treated. Isn't that fair? To act justly. It is just to treat others the way you would want to be treated, which is the golden rule that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, 12, where he says, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That has, that has to do with our conduct, not your words, your conduct, how you act. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Now, to love mercy is a step further. It's one step further than acting justly. To act justly, golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. To love mercy is you treat others well, even if they don't reciprocate. You still treat people well, even if they are a jerk to you. That's to love mercy. Because mercy is giving some, someone something they do not deserve or something they do deserve. And so what... Everyone deserves from us is respect. Everyone deserves to be treated well. Everyone deserves kindness. We are commanded to love people. And so we love mercy. And we are going to show mercy to people even if they don't reciprocate back to us. And you know what James says in James chapter 2? After he talked about uh, what good does it do to, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds. He wraps that whole teaching up with mercy triumphs over judgment. We're to love mercy. And in doing so, okay, if you treat people the way you want to be treated and you treat them well, even if they don't reciprocate, you know what you're doing? Walking humbly with, before the Lord. See, to walk humbly before the Lord has to do with how we treat others. That's why Micah put it there. If we act justly and love mercy, we will walk humbly with our God. Treating people well. So it's by our fruit our produce, what we produce by our words, yes, but mostly by our actions, that we buy favor in our relationships. But let me tell you, if you're a jerk to people, you won't have a lot of favor on your life. You will have disfavor. In other words, people aren't going to want to extend themselves very much for you. They're not going to want to help you out. They're not going to want to treat you well. But we buy favor in our relationships when we're good to people, it makes them feel good about themselves. But let me tell you, bearing good fruit, and that's really what we're talking about, <clears throat> bearing good fruit, it's not natural. It's just, it, it doesn't come naturally for us. Our instincts are to grasp. Our instincts are to take. Our instincts are to be first. Our instincts are to be right in an argument. Our instincts are to get the last word. Those are, the, those are the things that come naturally, at least to me. It's natural to be impatient. It's not natural to be patient. 
And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to help us. We need His help. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Because that is what I believe is the currency of the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control. Those nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Through each one of these, we will gain great wealth in our own lives, in our family's lives, and for the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, I'm going to repeat this. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Next week we're going to talk about love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then, and then Paul wraps up the fruit of the Spirit by saying this. Against such things there is no law. In other words, you don't need laws when you treat people with love. You don't need laws when you're patient, when you're kind, when you're good. Because laws are, are written to prevent bad behavior. But when you are walking in the fruit of the and, 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 and doing the fruits of the Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to move through your life, you don't need laws. You wouldn't think to steal from somebody because you love them. So you wouldn't need the law, thou shalt not steal or commit murder or bear false testimony. You don't need the laws when you're governed by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. So I'd like you to bow your head right now. <clears throat> and I'd like you to invite the Holy Spirit to help you in your life, in your walk, so that you can begin to produce. The produce of your life would be pleasing to the Lord. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 9, where Paul said this, we make it our goal to please the Lord. You want to please the Lord? Invite the Holy Spirit to help you in your relationships to live out and to begin to produce the fruits of the Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to talking to you next week when we talk about love.